going to talk about comets today, specifically a comet that is on its way into the inner solar system and may well treat us to quite a spectacular sight in a few weeks' time. Yeah, we have no idea what's going to happen to this comet, but we know a few things about it that indicate that it might well put on quite a show. It's called Comet Ison, and it's from a long way away. It is a kind of comet that has never ever been in our solar system before and it never ever will be again. It's a one-time visitor and not only that but it's going to pass very very close to the sun. It's called a sun grazing comet and those two facts together make it quite interesting. Comets can orbit the sun just like the planets do but they tend to orbit it in a different way. So I can, I can make a little model of the solar system here. Got, got our sun. This is absolutely not to scale. Most of the planets orbit in a plane and they tend to have orbits that are technically ellipses. Those orbits are governed by Kepler's laws of orbital dynamics, which are very well known, have been known for hundreds of years. But comets tend to do something very different. So instead of a slightly squashed circle, they can have orbits that are very, very elliptical, sort of the shape of this whole table. And they don't have to be located in the plane of the ecliptic, the same plane that all of those planets do. They can be tilted up at quite high angles. They can be oriented in all sorts of different directions. They can have orbits that take only a few years or a few tens of years to go around the sun. They can have orbits that take tens of thousands of years and they get flung way out into the outer solar system and beyond and then back in again. This special kind of comet is visiting us for, from the Oort cloud. So the Oort cloud is probably the, the, the source of a lot of these very distant orbiting comets. And it's probably, we think, a remnant of a leftover bit of when the solar system formed from a big disk of debris and material that got puffed up and sent out. It got sent out so far that it's actually, we think, probably billions of tiny little icy objects in a cloud about a light year in radius. That's a quarter of the distance away from the next nearest star. That's way, way beyond where the actual planets orbit. Those objects probably stay out there millions and millions of years, but they're very vulnerable to being perturbed and bumped around a bit. So a passing star or the gravitational field of the Milky Way might have nudged one just enough that it, it left the Oort cloud and it has plunged all the way into the inner solar system. But it's not on an elliptical orbit. It's not this closed squash circle. It's on a hyperbolic orbit. It's following a hyperbola that will take it in towards the sun, whip it round the sun in a sort of slingshot manner. This is exactly the kind of orbit that we send spacecrafts on round Jupiter to slingshot them out into the outer solar system. And then it's going to fly back off away and we're never going to see it again. What will happen to it? Um, well, it'll, it'll, it'll experience some very exciting and, and fun things around the sun. It may or may not make it around the sun, as we can talk about in a minute, and then it'll just, it'll just head back out, become cooler, become, if it, if it survives, it'll, it'll just wander off back into the outer solar system. So a generic name for a comet is known as a dirty snowball, which kind of reflects its composition. It's rock, it's ice, it's some organic compounds and some gas all mixed up together. When it's out in the cold reaches of the outer solar system, it's just a lump, it's not very, doing very much. But as it plunges in towards the sun, it gets gradually heated, and then interesting things start to happen. Material will vaporize off. Um, what you, you start off as a very solid-ish, lumpy nucleus that might be meters or kilometers across. Um, it will gain an atmosphere called the coma, and that will be puffy and, and, and gaseous and, and, and big. And then what we think of with the, the comet and where they get their name is from the tails that form. And you can actually get two kinds of tails. So if this is the coma, this is the nucleus plus the outer atmosphere of our comet, this comet is coming into the sun and the material is now being heated and it's starting to stream out behind it and it's forming this beautiful tail that is probably largely made up of dust. And that's what we tend to think of when we think about beautiful comets streaking across the sky. And in fact, the origin of the word comet refers to something with hair. So these are hairy objects, if you like. And 
this, con this, this tail, and this is an important point, it's not, it's not uh, following the direction of motion, so it's not streaming out behind the comet in the sense that my hair might be blowing behind me if I'm running. Um, it's, it's, it can actually follow kind of a curved path as it gets left behind in this orbit. So you can have kind of a, a, a curvy tail. But that's not the only kind of tail you have. The second kind of tail is called an ion tail. And this is the interaction of particles that are being pushed off the, the, the comet's nucleus and they're interacting with charged particles from the solar wind. And so if this is the sun here, the solar wind is pushing these, this, this, this ion tail out in a straight line behind the comet. And this is formed from interactions between material coming off the comet, gas, and the solar wind, the stream of charged particles that is going out in all directions from the sun. And so this solar wind is going to push this ion tail back and it's going to be in a straight line. The ion tail is always going to be pointing away from the sun because of the solar wind. The dust tail is, can be slightly curved and is going to streak out behind the, the comet in, in its orbit. And an interesting thing about the dust tail is that that material can stay there in orbit around the sun for a long time. And our orbit on Earth can intersect that remnant of dust. And when that happens, that's when we see these periodic meteor showers every year. So the, the Perseids in August is a famous meteor shower that happens every year. And that's because every year at that time, the Earth's orbit sweeps through this leftover material from a comet. And those tiny little particles burn up in the atmosphere and give us a, a great meteor show. Comet Ison was discovered in September 2012. And as its orbit was calculated, this is, this, it was way out by the orbit of Jupiter. So it was before it had any sort of spectacular tail or anything like that. And as observations were taken and its orbit was plotted, we started to realize that it was going to be one of these sun grazing comets. And in fact, it was going to come within about 1.8 million kilometers of the sun at its perihelion, its distance of closest approach. That's three times the solar radius. That's really, really close. At the time of filming, I think nine different spacecraft have actually observed and will continue to observe Comet Ison as it approaches the inner solar system. So we're early November now, 2013. We're a few weeks away from perihelion. The big question is, what's going to happen to Ison? It may well be that it disintegrates before it even gets close to the sun. That's a possibility. Once it gets around the sun, it has to contend with temperatures of 5,000 degrees. It has to contend with the tidal gravitational field of the sun, which might may well tear it apart. It's going to be traveling at 400 kilometers per second at that time. To put that in perspective, if we were to travel from the University of Nottingham campus here in Nottingham to the University of Nottingham campus in Ningbo, China, if we did it that fast, 400 kilometers per second, it would only take us 23 seconds. So it's going to whip around the sun and if it makes it out the other side, that's when we may well be in for a treat because then it will feel the full force of the solar wind of it, its orbital journey. And that's when it may well brighten, very, very bright, may be visible to the naked eye, may, if we're lucky, have a beautiful long tail um, and we will be able to observe it very well. It's not the most romantic of names. ISIN stands for the International Scientific Optical Network, which was the coordinated survey of people using ground-based telescopes to look for comets.